Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and I want to welcome a very special guest, former chief historian for NASA, also was with the Smithsonian Institute, and it is known by many people within the restoration as the biographer of Joseph Smith III, pragmatic prophet, Roger Lonius. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Nice to be here. So, Roger, one of the reasons I had you on is that it really kind of helps things go full circle. So before I started the channel, I started engaging people in the community of Christ via a book club. Uh, uh, there was a, Every Thursday night, there were about 100 people on this Zoom call, and we were talking about this book. So every Thursday, we would cover two chapters, one or two chapters in the book, and I think we did it over the course of six to eight weeks. And then that's where I started engaging people in the restoration and started telling them about my idea for doing this channel. And that's kind of your book played a role in uh, helping launch me because the Community of Christ folk were the first people on board with my endeavor. And of course, I read your book. I checked it out of the Lake County Public Library in Northwest Indiana and uh, read the book about 15 years ago. And I'll tell you, I was just so impressed with Joseph Smith. I really liked the guy. And there were so many aspects about him that I found admirable. Um, I've done enough talking. I'd like for you to talk to me about your research into the writing this book. And you had mentioned to me that it was part of your dissertation, which would then was later published as a book. So maybe give it a time frame, and also just talk a little bit about um, the fact that you were born and raised in the community of Christ as well. So let's just go at that. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I have a long background in the uh, reorganized church, uh, community of Christ. Uh, and, um, uh, but I wasn't necessarily born into it. I attended my parents' baptism. So uh, they were converts to the church when I was a kid. Uh, uh, and, and I was four or five at that point. But um, I, I was baptized when I was nine years old uh, into in those days, the RLDS, Reorganized Church, and uh, raised in that. I went to college at uh, Graceland College, which is the RLDS version of BYU, basically, now Graceland University in Lamoni, Iowa. And uh, there I was fascinated by, with history, just in general. I, I, I you know, I, I went, like a lot of people, went through a couple of different majors before I finally uh, got to history as my as my major and uh, and got very involved in sort of um, uh, public history museums and things of that nature and uh, when I finished my bachelor's degree I went to LSU where I get did a PhD and uh, finished that in 1982 my dissertation was the biography of Joseph Smith the third the book that you see there and it was published uh, by University of Illinois Press in 1988, so six years after I finished my PhD. Uh, it's been a very successful book in, in, in many ways, and I, I think it stood the test of time quite well. Um, there's obviously more to be said about Joseph Smith III than what I said in the book, and, uh, and other people have followed up and done other things on, on him, and that's to be expected. I'd love to see at some point somebody take on a, a full-fledged biography of him. Uh, once again, it's now, you know, been a number of years since that book appeared, and, and a new generation has, uh, has come, and, and they should re-explore these same areas. I'm just curious, what made you decide to write your dissertation on Joseph Smith III? Well, uh, you know, it was uh, suggested to me. Uh, uh, so Mark McKiernan, uh, who um, uh, was sort of a mentor in my undergraduate and graduate days, uh, suggested to me that this would be a good topic for um, a dissertation. And he was absolutely right. I talked to other people, Alma Blair, who's a professor of history at, at Graceland at the time, Bill Russell and Paul Edwards were sort of my, my professors there who in, in the history community. And they all thought it was a good idea. So I took it on and nobody had done anything with him of a serious nature previously. Uh, so it, it seemed like a good, uh, a good fit. I, I had to sell it a little bit. Um, uh, at LSU, there was uh, uh, some of the folks there had sort of a, um, a, a sense that biography was not the best type of history. And, and because, by, because by definition, biography is about an elite. 
And does a, an elite a discussion of an elite really tell you much about that particular history? So that's that's a valid criticism. I've made that criticism myself, but I've done several biographies, and I I think it is a good entree into uh, what is taking place uh, in uh, in the past. So uh, in that sense, I I. Uh, I explored Joseph Smith III, but as much as anything, it's about the reorganized church in the in the 19th century as well. Uh, he led the church for a long, long time, and uh, you know, 54 years. And uh, in that sense, he really shaped uh, the institution in a fundamental way. So it 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 tells his story, but it also tells the story of the RLDS. You no, know, um, actually, I, one thing that just popped in my mind is. You know, when Emma Smith, just so you all know, folks, you know, this is the this is the founding prophet, if you will, of the reorganized church, Emma Smith and much of her family, they stayed back, they didn't follow Brigham, and uh, they would reorganize on April 6, 1860. Uh, but young Joseph Smith III, uh, for a while, Emma was actually attending a Methodist church. Um, how much did um, any of that may have influenced Joseph Smith III, maybe attending different Protestant churches, I think in particular the Methodist church? Well, I mean, obviously he had a background that's broader. I mean, he, you know, he was born into the early Mormon movement, uh, born in Kirtland, Ohio in 1832, uh, and uh, traveled with his family to, you know, from Kirtland to far west to Nauvoo, and um, and was in Nauvoo in 1844 when his when his father was killed at Carthage Jail. The um, uh, the Smith family after that uh, refused to um, uh, and Emma Smith was really the driver behind this to uh, to adhere with uh, with Brigham Young. Uh, there is good work that's been done on Emma Smith and uh, and and they pretty much got the story right in terms of what to say about that. Um, uh, she was perfectly willing to uh, accept Joseph Smith III's role in the RLDS and went with him to Amboy in 1860, where he affiliated with the reorganized church. Uh, and let me just correct one thing for listeners who may not be as familiar with this. He wasn't the originator of the reorganized church. Uh, that it was already in existence. Uh, if there were two individuals that were the sort of senior people, it was uh, Zenas Gurley and Jason Briggs uh, in the early 1850s. But by 1860, he'd become a part of the church and became the leader. The um, uh, and, and so Emma Smith uh, uh, did have a, a, a sojourn where she attended other churches, was involved in, in various other groups, uh, and she had a more moderate perspective on uh, this than certainly uh, the, the, the Mormons who went to Utah had in terms of thinking about this. Um, and Joseph Smith III did as well, and, and that was partly, I think, her influence. It was partly also his own thinking. I mean, he was quite moderate, uh, and uh, Alma Blair, a number of years ago, uh, coined the term that the, the reorganized church were the moderate Mormons. And I think that that's a, 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 a reasonable characterization of, of that particular organization, rejecting the more radical elements of Mormonism, carried to their logical conclusion in Utah, and, um, uh, but still maintaining their apartness from larger mainstream American Protestantism. So uh, another book that I checked out of the Lake County Public Library was Mormon Enigma. Uh, that's the story of uh, Emma Smith, uh, written by Linda King Newell and Valine Tippett Avery. Um, that would be one of the books I imagine that you would recommend as a good jump starting point for Emma. Ab absolutely, a very fine book, a, a, a excellent biography, and and, uh, and and Val and Linda did a great job with that particular book. Um, and uh, you know, and, and it it extends beyond the things that I was interested in with Joseph Smith III, but it certainly squares with what I know about Joseph Smith III. You know, you had mentioned earlier about how there was an elitist attitude. The thought was, is the biographies are inherently elitist and that you're just focusing on one person. But one of the things that, that really stuck out about your book was you did take the time to talk about the people who helped establish the RLDS and paved the way for 
uh, Joseph Smith III. Um, you had brought up Briggs and Zenas, and, and uh, I felt like reading the book, whether it was 15 years ago or a year ago, that I kind of got to know these individuals in your book. So I think that was important that you gave us some biography on those people and how important of a role they played in the formation of the church. One of the things that really struck me was Leah around 1859, one of the individuals you talked about, the name slips my mind who it was, but there was an example of a tongue speech or speaking in tongues that was almost kind of helped establish some things within the church. And so we have actually a history of Pentecostal uh, outpourings, if you will, in that church as well, uh, kind of what we saw in uh, Kirtland, Ohio. Maybe just talk a little bit about that and the individuals we just, I mentioned. Well, I mean, sure. The uh, um, So all of Mormonism has, um, I, I, and, and it's, it's, it's a totally logical thing. If you believe that there is a prophet uh, that is on the earth and that God is speaking to that prophet and, and uh, through that prophet, you by definition uh, accept the idea of the so-called gifts of the spirit, revelation, uh, spiritual encounters, tongues, interpretation thereof, uh, administration for the healing of the sick. I could go on and on with these sorts of things. And, and that was a fundamental aspect of Mormonism from the very beginning. Um, the RLDS, the Organized Church, of course, uh, embrace those sorts of ideas as well. But they always get into uh, uh, difficulties with this because, uh, and Joseph Smith III phrased it like this, it's not the gifts of the spirits that the, that's the problem, it's the excess of these things that may or may not be uh, God-given. And, uh, and so you sort of have to control and vector these in ways that, uh, uh, that uh, allow each to, uh, you know, experience this, but also not to overwhelm. And, um, and, there, and the history of Mormonism is rife with these stories of, of name the person of your choice who, uh, who claims a revelatory experience that may be at odds with what the church leadership says. And, um, and there, there's always a, uh, 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 an issue with that and who has control. Um, and that's the case in the 1850s and the RLDS and, and later, by the way, it's not just uh, that one time frame, and it's the case early on and it's the case today for that matter. So, you know, you call the book, uh, you call, subtitle it Pragmatic Prophet. I sometimes mistakenly will call the book Reluctant Prophet um, because it seemed like, um, I don't know, it seemed like he wasn't entirely sure if that's what he wanted to do in, before he took the mantle of the prophet. Um, uh, could you maybe just kind of uh, address that? Sure. Well, I mean, Joseph Smith III uh, is a complex character. And um, uh, he embraced his father's teachings to some extent. Uh, he was raised with sort of this sense that he should succeed his father. Uh, that goes back to very early in his life. And so he sort of had this. And, and, and that's not uncommon for people who are raised in sort of a sense of, of being a, a, in, in a royal family, for instance. Um, and, and that was his case there, but he was hesitant about it. And that's true for lots of other people who have similar sorts of, of, uh, family expectations of them. The, um, uh, and, and he spent a number of years sort of, you know, questioning whether or not this was the right path for him. And from the time he sort of reached his maturity, uh, until 1860, I mean, he goes back and forth on this. And, you know, there's, there, there are numerous instances in which he, you know, describes his sort of ambivalence uh, uh, toward accepting this role, which he th thought he probably should take, but, uh, but wasn't really sure that it was the right thing to do. And he wanted confirming evidence for that. And, and that at some level was, uh, you know, was a religious experience for him. I mean, he's, he talks about those things uh, in his memoirs and, and elsewhere. And, um, uh, and he finally accepted the idea in 1860 that he should, should take that role. And at that point, you know, he didn't really look back on that as a 
as a bad decision for the rest of his life, but he certainly um, questioned his, his place and how hard he should push. And so the pragmatic part of the, of the, of the thesis of the book is that, uh, you know, he took the long view on things. And so how do you negotiate um, a path forward in something that, that you think is the right path, but other people have different opinions? Do you just beat them about the head and shoulders and force them to do what you tell them to do? Or do you try to gently uh, persuade and vector them in a direction that you think makes sense? And in some cases, as a young man in 1860, he had the capability to wait out older people who had other positions on things. And, and, and there's lots of instances of that in his career as well. So he uh, actually was a lawyer by training. Um, and so uh, he kind of had a pragmatic mindset, but also kind of legalistic mindset as well. Um, and so he brought these traits to uh, the, the role that he played. So obviously, is well educated. Um, he is a man of his times, but he's also uh, kind of a visionary. Uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about is about the time that the church was being formed. Of course, the church was uh, the the nation was about to uh, commence a civil war, and uh, maybe just talk a little bit about how the RLDS uh, dealt with the civil war, but also how it dealt with the race issue as well. Yeah. So. Um... You know, the reorganized church is largely Midwestern church. And uh, at the time that uh, Joseph Smith III affiliated with it in 1860, it was relatively small. I mean, I, you know, it's hard to say what the formal numbers were. Um, you know, there's not a good census of that sort of thing, but it was probably less than 500 people. The uh, And they were, you know, sort of gathered around uh around Nauvoo, Amboy, uh, Wisconsin, a few in Iowa, a few in Missouri. And, um, and, they, and they sort of get gathered up. One of the things that happened, um, and I sort of have to go back on this a little bit to talk about, it. you know, the, the, uh, the, the sudden death of Joseph Smith Jr. in 1844 sent the church into disarray. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, there is a succession crisis that resulted from that. And there was a splintering of the church in which people went in all directions. The, um, and and some, of those, some of those leaders that emerged in the aftermath of that 1844 assassination uh, are well known. Uh, you know, Lyman White took a group to, to Texas, uh, a member of the Council of Twelve. Uh, Alpheus Cutler took a group to Minnesota. I could go, you know, on and on. Um, William Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith Jr., you know, led for a time his own group, and and Sidney Rigdon took a group, and 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 and, and so on. So it, there's a splintering of the organization. The, the single largest faction, but it was only a faction, uh, was led by Brigham Young. And, um, and, and it may have not been the largest group of, of all of these. I mean, if you, comp if you bring together all the other factions that are out there, they may have outnumbered the number of people associating with Brigham Young. Uh, in early 1844, Joseph Smith, the, uh, Joseph Smith Jr. wrote a letter in which he explained that the that the Mormon Church had something in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand adherents. That's probably an overstatement. I'm pretty sure it is, maybe by a lot. But um, if he's even close to that, then the group that went to Utah is a very very tiny fraction. Um, but uh, but even if it's you know half that or you know, 25% of that. Uh, there's, that means that there's a lot of people that are sort of elsewhere who don't affiliate with Brigham Young or don't do so immediately and certainly don't just pick up and, and move to Utah. So that's, those people are in different places. And, uh, and the RLDS can trace uh, individual congregations, most of which were sort of independent for a number of years. Um, in, in the Midwest that sort of eventually affiliated with 
the reorganized church. Uh, I like to talk about the group that was in Brush Creek, Illinois, which is in Southern Illinois. And um, my parents are from that region. And, um, and there's a RLDS campground at Brush Creek today, a, 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 a ground where they have religious gatherings. And there's a log cabin there that dates from the 1840s. That was the our, that was the church that was independently organized there uh, at that time and maintained its independence until the membership of that organization, of that individual church affiliated with the RLDS. And it's been in continuous existence since that time. The, uh, and, and there are other instances like that. So it's that Midwestern group that is gathered together uh, by the RLDS beginning in the 1850s. And when Joseph Smith III becomes the leader of this group, it gives added impetus because now you've got not just a, a counterbalancing religious group believing a lot of the tenets of Mormonism, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, that the Book of Mormon is legitimate, that there's, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, rejecting some of the more extreme versions of Mormonism that are expressed in Utah. And, um, and with Smith at the helm, you know, he's sort of the heir apparent from the 1840s on. The line of kings have now become a part of uh, the RLDS church. And it was enormously attractive then for people to gather into that group, especially if they did not accept all the things that Brigham Young and the Utah leadership is espousing. So with that being the case, um, the RLDS join together and become a major force, especially in the 1860s, and uh, are attractive to a lot of people who have their heritage in that early Mormon movement. And Joseph Smith III is a great leader for that group because he doesn't push them too hard. They may have divergent ideas about what they think the church should be. And he's allow them, he allows them to express that um, in, in cases that go on for many, many years and, uh, and doesn't push them too hard to accept a hardcore set of beliefs that, um, that are, uh, are, are, are not fully accepted by other people as well. A lot of people don't know this, but Joseph Smith III actually believed in baptism uh, for the dead. Um, I just want to kind of like broaden out the discussion a little bit about the canon of the RLDS. So within 10 years of him becoming um, the, the prophet, um, they come out with their own edition of the Book of Mormon. Then we have the Joseph Smith translation or the inspired version of the Bible that is published because Emma had the uh, manuscript. And then but we also don't have the Book of Abraham is part of the canon. Right. So just kind of talk about the early formation of the doctrine, um, the fact that he believed in baptism for the dead, and, and, and talk a little bit about their canon. Well, sure. So temple rituals writ large are an issue in the context of uh, of the RLDS and, and baptism for the dead was clearly something that the early Mormons in Nauvoo embraced. And, uh, and there's no reason to believe anywhere that Joseph Smith III disagreed that that was something that they should practice uh, eventually. And, uh, but he always viewed it as a permissive doctrine, one that you could perhaps uh, undertake, but in his particular belief, he said, you know, we've not been asked to do that by God. So, uh, so we're not, we're, we're just going to hold off on that. But he believed in it, others believed in it. Um, but the reality is that as time passes, and the longer that you maybe you say that you think it's a, a, a worthwhile thing to do, but you don't engage in it, and you don't teach it as something necessary to the gospel, as new generations emerge, they don't embrace it. And that's what happened. He sort of waited it out. Uh, you know, he did say, well, you know, when we build the temple in, in, in uh, independence, and probably we will practice it. But, um, but we have no explicit God-given requirement to do so now. Therefore, we're not going to. And, um, 
And over time, uh, not teaching it, not practicing it, most people just sort of put it aside and didn't bother with it. So I, I'd be willing to bet, however, that there are some members of the RLDS church into the 20th century who still th- said, oh, okay, I think we should probably do that. <laughs> really interesting. And so uh, maybe talk a little bit about, too, about uh, their canon, the, the process of, of coming up with their own uh, version of the Book of Mormon and, um, and, and also the inspired translation. Okay. Well, I mean, the Book of Mormon is pretty much um, uh, the, the same version with some modification over time, but not a lot, uh, of what had been published in Joseph Smith Jr.'s lifetime. Um, the uh, inspired version of the Bible uh, is an 1860s uh, publication that the RLDS uh, used the um uh, uh, the text that Joseph Smith Jr. had uh, uh, had developed um, and that Emma Smith had protected for many, many years and hidden, quite frankly, from other folk because she was afraid somebody might try to take it. And uh, that was that was published. It included uh, expanded versions of uh, of the Old Testament that uh, uh, are now a part of the Pearl of Great Price uh, in the LDS Church. Uh, and, and so in that sense, it's um, a, a, a more or less a faithful rendition of what, what Joseph Smith Jr. was engaged in, and that's the official canon uh, for the RLDS today in terms of the Bible. Uh, although there are lots of RLDS members who use other versions, and that there's no prohibition against doing that. So let's just kind of start talking about one of the main things about that separates the RLDS from the LDS church, and that would be the issue of polygamy. <laughs> now, uh, Emma, of course, denied that any polygamy was going on. Uh, the official church stance for many, many years was that Joseph did not practice polygamy. Talk about Joseph Smith III encountering the uh, people, engaging people who said, yes, he did uh, practice it, including, I guess, people who would have been part of the RLDS. Emma's uh, denial that it happened or assertion that it didn't happen. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about David Hiram and him also engaging um, the polygamous wives of his yeah. father. So uh, polygamy is the one of the great bugaboos in, uh, in the RLDS. And um, Emma Smith, I mean, we know this. Uh, I, I mean, I'll just state point blank and all of your viewers, I'm sure, know this already. Joseph Smith did practice polygamy. There's no question about that in my mind, and I say, I, and I say that point blank in the book. Um, Emma Smith always rejected it. She always hated it. She thought it was a bad thing, and, and basically, she viewed it as he's cheating on me, which he was. Um, and, but there was enough sort of, uh, you know, over time, she could sort of deny that it ever happened, uh, and and. You know, there are stories and and Val Avery and Linda Newell write about this in their biography of him about how she waffles back and forth in Nauvoo. You know, sometimes she sort of accepts it at some level and other times she's dead set against it and very angry about it. And, and that's a very easy position that I could see someone taking who's a wife. And um, and she, after Joseph Smith's death, taught her children. You know, dad never did this. And um, and these stories about this are just, you know, lies. And Joseph Smith III, who wanted to believe that his father was a good and just man, uh, and whose recollections of him, I mean, he was almost 12 years old when his father died. So it's not like he had no memory of him, uh, also had that that fundamental belief that his father was good and just and a good and just man would not do these things. So, uh, so it's easy for him to accept that argument. Uh, and, and he's, and he runs smack into uh, RLDS members almost immediately after becoming the president of the, of the RLDS church, whose heritage goes back to the Nauvoo experience. People like William Marks, who became a very, who was the stake president in Nauvoo, and who becomes a member of the RLDS first presidency, uh, who has a different belief in this. 
who says, yeah, your dad did it. And, uh, but he thought, but, uh, you know, he sort of repented at the end and he was going to do away with it. So that's one of the elements of that story that has become very common in the RLDS movement. Um, and, and then William Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith Jr., uh, knew what was taking place, and he affiliates with the RLDS as well. Uh, Jason Briggs and Zenas Gurley both uh, have their heritage that go back that far, and they knew what was going on as well. And now, all of these people were opposed to the idea, but... Uh, but they weren't willing to deny that Joseph Smith was engaged in it. And, uh, and, and, and Joseph Smith III really had a, sort of a, a, a blind spot when it came to these issues. And it was really built around, you know, I believe my dad was good and just, and, he, and a good and just man would never do this. So, um, you know, he spent a lot of time as the president of the RLDS church sort of, you know, trying to beat this down. Uh, trying to trying to stop these ideas. And there's even a letter in which he writes to William Smith, the brother of the founder of Mormonism, in which he says, you know, and it's sort of a veiled comment. And, and he says, in effect, you know, you and I disagree on some things, but it would be better for you not to say publicly some of this. And they both knew what they were talking about. And, um, and, and in that sense, um, you know, he was able to sort of maintain a facade of innocence for Joseph Smith Jr. Uh, when he went to Utah beginning in uh, the 1870s, he made a couple of trips out there. Um, you know, he sort of ended up in the polygamy hunt out there trying to, you know, collect information, get affidavits, things of this nature about this particular subject, always with the with the intention that he's going to disprove these allegations that his father had been a polygamist. Uh, this led, I think it was Joseph F. Smith, his cousin, uh, who was in Utah, to collect all kinds of affidavits from the, um, from the plural wives, <laughs> and talking about how they did it. And, and there's a whole body of evidence about, about this. Uh, it's firsthand evidence, but it's collected way after the fact. And there's uh, uh, you know, some tainting of the evidence because of that. But be that as it may, um, I believe it's pretty clear that Joseph Smith Jr. practiced this. Joseph Smith III was absolutely, you know, and over time, it becomes a more hardened position. I'm just not going to tolerate this as uh, uh, something that we're going to accept it officially. He taught his children that. And of course, Frederick Madison Smith, who, who succeeded him, Israel A. Smith, who succeeded Fred, and W. Wallace Smith, all sons of Joseph Smith Jr., uh, were taught this by their father, and they all believed it pretty much without any fail. Talk about another family member <laughs> that Zad brought up was uh, David Hiram. Sure. So he, um, he actually started engaging some of these plural wives. And it, it appears that while he was out there, he seemed to have some kind of mental break that also occurred. So maybe just talk about those two things and see and, and how they may be related. Yeah, I'm not sure they're related. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, this gets back to the question of David Hiram Smith and his um, and his mental illness. Um, uh, clearly, he was mentally ill. He was placed into the uh, asylum for the mentally ill in Elgin, Illinois. Uh, by Joseph Smith III, uh, and he was, and, and, and in the aftermath of an incident in which David chased um, Joseph Smith III's wife around the house with a butcher knife, and at that point, he, I mean, it was known that David had had issues before this, but he hadn't been violent necessarily before this. But at that point, he realized he had to do something, and David spent the rest of his life in the in this in, in asylum. Uh, and some days he was more or less fine, and other days he was not, and you know, so he had good days and bad days. But, uh, but then that, that begs the question, uh, what caused this? And, you know, some people have suggested that it was him being confronted by um, the, the reality of polygamy uh, in Utah that caused this event. Uh, 
and um, and maybe that's the case, but you know I'm not sure about that. You know, there's been people who've done uh, good work on on David Smith, and one of them is Val Avery, who wrote a biography, uh, and it's a good solid piece of work. But before that, there were two RLDS historians uh, who had strikingly different perspectives on uh, on this particular issue. Uh, one was uh, Paul Edwards, who um, was one of my professors at Graceland College, who later on led Temple School uh, for the RLDS, and um, who has a, a, a lineage uh, as a member of the Smith family. His father was F. Henry Edwards, who was married to Alice Smith, who was a, uh, related to Joseph Smith Jr. and Joseph Smith III. So um, uh, he his argument, which he published in, I believe it was BYU Studies, was uh, said that, you know, uh, uh, David was um, a, a sensitive soul uh, who had, uh, and that there's sort of a, some mental illness associated with the Smith family. Uh, and he himself, uh, Paul Edwards, had experienced some of this as a, uh, seeing it uh, in other members of the family. And so, you know, essentially David was, was, uh, was had mental illness because he was a Smith. That was his argument. Um, Mark McKiernan wrote an article that um, appeared, um, might've been in BYU studies, might've been in dialogue, I can't remember now, but um, in which he said, uh, it might've been the Saints Herald too, for that matter, the RLDS periodical, um, in which he said that, uh, the, the statement of the mental health of David Smith sounds like he may have been hypoglycemic, having low blood sugar, which they couldn't diagnose in those days and really couldn't treat very well. And, uh, and that the bouts that he had of mental illness might have been resu the result of that. And um, you can believe what you want to believe. Um, I find it fascinating that uh, that uh, Paul Edwards, who has a heritage as a Smith, makes the case that he makes. Mark McKiernan, who was hypoglycemic, makes the case that he makes, um, suggesting that history is really is really pretty autobiographical. I think. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so. Uh... You know, and it's always fascinating to me is that, you know, a lot of when David Hiram went to Utah, they, a lot of people knew his father and they felt that he was very much like the mannerisms and the look yeah. and everything like that's Joseph, like he's back almost, you know, so he was treated very well by those folk when he was out there. Um, you know, speaking of just kind of like the complexity of the relationship between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the RLDS is you had... Um, the rival claim to the temple lot. So you have the temple yeah. lot case, and uh, you have this group, uh, Church of Jesus, Church of Christ temple lot, that laid claim to the plot of land that Joseph Smith dedicated as a temple. Maybe just talk about the machinations that was going on about trying to uh, uh, lay claim to that uh, by the RLDS. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, and it's not just the temple lot case. It's uh, it's also the Kirtland Temple case. Uh, uh, you know almost 15 years earlier in which um, uh, the Kirtland Temple, uh, uh, abandoned by the church in the 1830s, uh, eventually comes under the, uh, the control of Mark Forscott, and, uh, who is an RLDS member. And um, there's a, a court case in which uh, uh, the RLDS claim that they are the legacy church of uh, the early Mormons and therefore should have a right to this property. And, um, and they sort of got control of the temple. And, uh, and, and so uh, they use that as a, a, as a proof that, uh, that they are the legitimate successor of early Mormonism and that the Utah Mormons are not in that category. The same is true with the uh, Temple Lot case in the 1890s uh, in which there was efforts to try to, uh, to demonstrate that the RLDS is the legitimate inheritor of the legacy of the early church rather than any of these other groups. 
um, and the, the Church of Christ, the Temple Lot uh, Church, was the uh, was a a, a a a part of that particular case. The LDS Church in Utah was not uh, at that particular time. They really couldn't do much uh, in this. Their uh, senior leaders were polygamists, and they were sort of wanted uh, in, in the U.S. So. Uh, so they didn't really uh, have a lot of say in what was taking place in that Temple Lot case. But in, in both cases, uh, the RLDS were able to make a claim based upon legal precedent uh, and ballyhooed this everywhere, that they were the legitimate inheritors of early Mormonism. And Joseph Smith III was very proud of that, was able to use that over and over again and was not, and was not shy about doing so. So, um, I, I and, and of course, just just so people folks know that with the Temple Lot case, you know the the, the LDS Church um, was basically backing the Temple Lot's claim, and uh, so there were a series of lawsuits that occurred, and eventually, basically, you know, Temple Lot ended up winning, and that's why to this day, if you go to uh, Independence, you'll see that there's a chapel there, right, and and the open space where that temple is. So, that, talk a little bit about that too. Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, so the Temple Lot, um, you know, the original, the original location is several acres, uh, and the Temple Lot has control of sort of the, the high ground of this particular area, and, and it dates from that Temple Lot case. Uh, and I think that's like two and a half acres or three acres, something like that. It's not a large amount, and there's other grounds around that. The RLDS has a fair amount of it, and they built their temple on a portion of that particular land. The, uh, the LDS Church has the Mormon Visitor Center that's right there as well, and, uh, and, and other uh, things that they built on the property. And, and, and so the claimants all have a piece of this, and they can each sort of claim success based upon that. So um, one of the more interesting things that happened, too, is you had talked about how basically Joseph Smith III wanted the lay claim to be the legitimate successor. And one of the things he did was you had the World Parliament of Religions in the 1890s, I believe in Chicago, and essentially he kind of got de facto recognition from them uh, on some level. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't recall a lot about what I wrote about that, <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, Joseph Smith III attended the World Council of Religions, a part of the Columbian Exhibition uh, in, uh, eight, in 1893 in Chicago. Um, the uh, and, and there was this world group that gathered, lots of uh, various religious groups were there. Uh, he, of course, showed up, and there was, there was interest in what he had to say, and, and, he, uh, and he made a claim as the legitimate inheritor of, of his father's legacy in early Mormonism, and was accepted in that particular way. Beyond that, I can't recall the details, but... Yeah, it's just interesting uh, parallel history. You know, I just, I was just thinking about this, you know, he had characters like John C. Bennett. Um, <laughs> he tried reaching out to Joseph Smith III. This, this character, I, he was quite something. But maybe talk about how he made an attempt to reach out to Joseph Smith III. Yeah, so, uh, so John C. Bennett, you know, bounces in and out of, of early Mormonism in the 1840s in Nauvoo. And he, was, he, he gained the ear of Joseph Smith Jr. He becomes a member of the first presidency. He's the first mayor of Nauvoo. He's a major general in the Nauvoo Legion. And he's, uh, he, he's very much a, 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 a grifter. And he sort of demonstrated that, I think, repeatedly. He floated in and out of other successor um, Mormon churches after the fact, you know, he had correspondence with, uh, with Sidney Rigdon for a time. He, um, uh, he corresponded with Brigham Young and there was nothing that came of that. He contacts Joseph Smith. Nothing really comes of that either. And, and I suspect all of these groups sort of want to stay away from him. He's, uh, he's well known as somebody that you don't want to be too closely allied with. And, and clearly Joseph Smith III was not interested in, in engaging with him very much. So, you know, um, it's fascinating because there was a movie that just recently came out and I've had the writer and director on and one of his chief critics on my program to talk about uh, the, uh, this, this kind of what some people would term a conspiracy theory. Uh, the, book, the movie is called Who Killed Joseph Smith and asserts that it was kind of an inside job. One of the things I wanna just talk about broadly 
is that one of the founding principles of the RLDS is that they uh, asserted that Joseph did not practice polygamy and that there was a betrayal of some kind uh, to the principles that Joseph Smith stood for. And so you have this rivalry between Brigham Young and the, R and, and, and the RLDS church. And so there's been this, this long simmering hatred and rivalry that was going on for a very long time between the two churches. Maybe just talk about how that affected the mindset of people who stayed in, back in Missouri. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, um, the people who make up the RLDS and, and they, they sort of coalesce around the, uh, in the RLDS church uh, around the personality of Joseph Smith III. Uh, you know, there's some around beforehand, but it really takes off in the 1860s where you've got, I've said this before in this podcast, I've said it in other places, sort of the line of kings becomes affiliated with the RLDS. Uh, Emma Smith, the wife of the president, all of the children, all of the boys uh, become uh, leaders in the RLDS church. And, um, and one of them, David Hiram, who was... Um, and you mentioned it earlier, uh, people in Utah looked at him and they said, I see Joseph Smith here. And never mind the fact that he was born after Joseph Smith's death. He never knew his father. Uh, so when they say mannerisms were the same and things of this nature, that may be more wishful thinking than you might think. Although he certainly looked like his father. And, um, and in that sense, uh, you know, you could see that there's a resemblance. Joseph Smith III, of course, did as well. Um, at, at some level. And so there's a, a, a connection in that, in that way. But, um, but the, the one thing that makes the RLDS attractive more than anything else in the 19th century is this adamant opposition to polygamy. And, and it's not just that they argue that Joseph Smith Jr. did not institute it and did not practice it. It's that this is wrong. And uh, the church in Utah is doing something that's countervailing to the gospel as restored by Joseph Smith. And this group, the RLDS, are standing up for that. And if there was one thing that when you look from the outside in on Mormonism, uh, that's the one difference that you can firmly see between the RLDS and the Utah Mormons is polygamy, the practice of polygamy. Um, you know, the RLDS adamantly opposed it. Oppose it. They they say it's wrong, and uh, and and all of that is a, a part of their identity. So, for those who are maybe attracted to Mormonism at some level, but are not uh, willing to accept some of those kinds of ideas like plural marriage, uh, the RLDS becomes an attractive alternative. And they find that there's a large, not insubstantial number of people who, who come into the RLDS for that particular reason. It was really an identifying marker for the church in the 19th century. Um, and regardless of all the other issues that are out there, you know, baptism for the dead, you know, continuing revelation, Book of Mormon, all that other stuff, that sort of gets lost in the shuffle, especially if you're outside of Mormonism. But plural marriage, you can see distinctly, sets these two groups apart. So I wanted to touch base on a couple more issues that uh, make the RLDS somewhat unique as well, and that kind of uh, differentiated a little bit was one, um, the embracing of being kind of a peace church, um, which has manifested itself greatly in the modern church, and also the idea that uh, they did not believe in the Black peace, priesthood ban. So maybe just talk about those two things, too. Sure. Well, so the, the, the RLDS, um, and this is really uh, more a 20th century phenomenon than a 19th century one, uh, have embraced the idea of being a peace church. And so the RLDS temple in Independence is 
was said in the 18 in the 1984 revelation uh, uh, will be dedicated to the pursuit of peace and so on um and but the but the rlds has not historically been a peace church it's not like the amish it's not like the mennonites it's not like a lot of other uh, of, of these churches that are really what you can say are peace churches um they're they're not necessarily uh adamant in terms of telling everybody they should go join a military or things of this nature. But Joseph Smith III, um, you know, made a statement during the Civil War, and it's been reaffirmed since that time that, you know, if, if you're drafted, you serve. So you can't become a conscientious objector based upon uh, being a member of the RLDS church. So, um, and, and in that sense, uh, it, it sort of is less a peace church than you might think, but it, there's also, it, it's not a warmongering church, that's for sure, never was. The, uh, and, and it does not have a history of armed conflict against the federal government the way the Mormons do it, did in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So um, so that, that's important in, in terms of that, that context. Uh, and I should also, suggests that uh, that these are tied in the Civil War context with um, with where the RLDS came down on slavery and uh, and issues of race relations. Um, uh, Joseph Smith III was a diehard uh, anti-slavery person. He wrote in his memoirs. There are correspondence in his letter books. Uh, there's a variety of things about this in which he is, in which he talked about how evil the institution of slavery was, and um, and there are stories from the 1850s before he becomes a part of the RLDS, uh, in which he uh, uh, visited um, uh, uh, locations where there was things like the Lincoln Douglas debates, and he was a diehard Lincoln supporter. And, uh, and, and Lincoln's anti-slavery stance was one that he firmly accepted. Uh, he talks about the, the, the Fugitive Slave Act of the 1850s in which um, uh, slaves escaping into Illinois um, being pursued by slave catchers from Missouri or Kentucky or wherever it happened to be where there were slaves located nearby. Um, uh, as a part of the, uh, as a part of that particular act, they could force individuals in 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 non-slave states to act on their behalf to help catch slaves. And Joseph Smith III makes the, makes the point that will never happen. No way, no how. I will not do that. In fact, quite the opposite. If a runaway slave, uh, if I encounter a runaway slave, I will help them. So, um, so. That sort of sets the stage for this larger issue of race relations, and um, there is um, a, a long, complex, and I would contend uh, deeply disturbing history in early Mormonism about the um, the place of African Americans in the church and the denial of priesthood to. Uh, to those who are otherwise, except for their race, uh, perfectly legitimately qualified for that particular position. And the RLDS never adopted anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. There are statements of the RLDS in general conferences during the 1860s in which they, uh, they, they talk about the universal nature of, of the gospel and that how all are welcome and that, um, that there is explicitly in 1865 a statement that uh, that uh, African Americans, freedmen, uh, should and may be ordained uh, to uh, to the priesthood in the uh, in the RLDS Church. So that's a fundamental difference from what was taking place in Utah. And just you, you talked to me the other day about how there was actually a congregation or two in Alabama that were integrated for a while. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the RLDS has pretty much mirrored uh, sort of polite American society in terms of race relations. They're not, 
uh, you know, the church as a whole is not, you know, diehard abolitionist egalitarian necessarily, but um, but in the context of the Civil War and in the um, uh, abolition of slavery and in the role of the freedmen in the aftermath of the Civil War during Reconstruction, the RLDS is sort of following along with, with larger society there. And there are not a lot of members in the American South uh, for the RLDS, but there are some. And uh, during the Reconstruction era, there's more, and there's more missionaries are sort of sent into those areas. They convert some people. There are local congregations that are formed. And in a, in a few instances, I've, uh, there are records for Alabama that suggest that, um, that there are congregations in which there were white members and African-American members, and they worship together, uh, at least for a time. Now, that was a constraint that, um, uh, that did not last, or uh, I shouldn't use the term constraint, uh, a, a position that, that, that did not last in the aftermath of Reconstruction, in the rise of sort of the Jim Crow segregation South, uh, there were efforts to sort of segregate those churches as well. And they ultimately ended up in that category. So you actually wrote another book called Invisible Saints right? that dealt with uh, race. Um, just maybe briefly talk a little, just touch on um, some of the issues that, like you had mentioned, they were polite society, but there were also some people that wanted not to, to have integration and, 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 and quite frankly, some of them had racist uh, views. Yeah, there, there, there's no question. I mean, uh, the RLDS is no more nor less racist than any other group in the United States. Um, and, um, and so you see all of those positions uh, expressed in, in, in the RLDS. In, in the context of official declarations, what you see is, is sort of um, uh, a belief that all are welcome in the RLDS, regardless of race or background or any of these other things. Uh, and, in, and in the uh, implementation of that, there's an imperfect implementation. I, I, I like to say, you know, so there's a, there's a statement of, of, of positiveness up at this level, a, a, a policy, so to speak. But the implementation of it is down here. And the delta between these two points is where uh, there's a lot of discussion and, and can be and should be a lot of discussion. Uh, the policies that the RLDS put into place are pretty, are, are, are pretty easily defensible. The implementation of that is not. So yeah, I encourage people to check out the book Invisible Saints if they want to further investigate that history. Um, you know, you had mentioned that Joseph Smith III uh, took the long view. Right. In light of the changes that have happened to the RLDS, now called the Community of Christ, uh, changes that were made in 1984, um, if Joseph Smith were to plop down in Independence, Missouri today, would he recognize that church? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things about the RLDS, uh, today's RLDS or Community of Christ, that he probably wouldn't recognize. Um, but, you, you know, I, I mean, I don't think that um, that that would that would probably also be true of almost anybody else uh, from the 19th century, seeing America in the 21st century. They wouldn't necessarily recognize uh, what they're seeing today as, um, as something that, that they would necessarily always embrace. Um, you know, Joseph Smith, um, you know, was, I think, uh, in many ways, a visionary leader. He did a good job leading an organization, um, and passing it on to the next generation, uh, in a, in a credible way. But, um, but he wasn't, you know, shouldn't confuse, you should not confuse him with an urban liberal from the 1960s or, or later. Uh, you know, uh, he, he did not necessarily embrace African American equality in all, in all ways. Uh, there were racist tendencies that existed in his life um, as well. And, uh, and so in that sense, he was partly a product of his time. He may have risen above that in certain settings, but not always. Uh, he would probably have not have seen or been sympathetic to uh, the plight of LBGTQ uh, communities. Um, 
uh, he probably, uh, and not that there is overt sort of sexism in his, in his life, but he probably would not have been uh, in, uh, you know, fully on board with, uh, with sort of uh, feminist ideology and things of this nature. And, and, and that suggests that as a society, we have changed. You know, um, so I have Joseph Geisner, by the way, I'm going to have you on soon. And I apologize, I haven't had you on, but it's just been swamped with the uh, channel. Um, this is the volume one, and I guess you are going to be um, making a contribution to volume two of writing Mormon history. Just maybe preview a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, so Joe has uh, put together the first volume. It's quite successful. Very nice book. Uh, people talking about writing about the writing of history. And, um, and he asked me uh, a couple of years ago to contribute to the upcoming volume uh, when I saw him at a John Whitmer Historical Association meeting. And uh, so I am, uh, I've written an essay, he's going to publish it in this particular uh, new version that deals with uh, African Americans in the, in the RLDS church, uh, which is based on my, my book, Invisible Saints, also published that book published in 1988, the same year that Joseph Smith III appeared. Hmm, hmm. Um, so this is really cool that we're having this conversation. And of course, I wore this shirt, folks. Uh, I've taken <laughs> this out of the rotation because I wore it a lot, but I had to bring it out for this interview. I have the former chief NASA historian uh, that I'm talking to. And so uh, it goes to say, without saying that I got to ask you some questions, uh, a few things. Um, sure. Uh, First of all, just tell me, how did you get that job? Ah, uh, pure luck. So um, I finished my PhD in 1982 at LSU, and uh, I wrote my dissertation on Joseph Smith III. I've already said that. Um, but I, when I went looking for a job after finishing my PhD, I ended up working for the U.S. Air Force as a civilian historian, which took me into an entirely different area of history history of air power and, and, and those sorts of things. And I had no background in that. I was surprised I got the job in the first place, but, um, but I, uh, yeah, I sort of embraced that. I, you know, studied the subject. I learned more about it and, and, um, and I spent eight years working for the air force. And then lo and behold, in 1990, I, um, I saw, this is the pre-internet era, I saw literally on the bulletin board at the human resources office at, uh, at Scott Air Force Base, which is uh, where I was working just outside of St. Louis, uh, a job for an advertisement for a job for the chief historian for NASA. So I thought, well, that'd be fun. <laughs> and, and so I applied and uh, lo and behold, I was I was uh, uh, hired for that particular position. So in 1990, I moved from just outside of St. Louis to, um, to Washington, DC, where I went to work at NASA headquarters as the chief historian. And, uh, and I've sort of been involved in space history ever since. One of the things that I realized I needed to do, I had no background in this. So I put myself on a, on a reading list, uh, you know, uh, to read every book I could lay my hands on associated with this subject and, and, and became a specialist and have written uh, several books of, uh, on, my, on my own and uh, associated with that topic. Spent 12 years at NASA and in 2002, I um, accepted a position at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum uh, where I was um, involved in space history as a curator at that point. Ultimately, I spent 15 years at the Smithsonian. Uh, the last few years, I was the associate director uh, for the Air and Space Museum and uh, finally retired only in 2017 um, after 35 years as a federal historian, all of it doing aerospace history. So uh, I posted in the Mormon Historians Facebook group, uh, asked them, hey, would you have any questions about the RLDS? And, Joseph Smith III, but also any questions of regarding um, the space program and NASA and everything. And somebody had mentioned talk, it's a Google uh, uh, Roger Lonius and conspiracies. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I, I looked it up. And apparently, you know, I, I remember the 1990s, um, kind of the X-Files world, um, moon landing was fake. I actually had, I don't know if you even heard of this, but I actually had my hands on a book that claimed that the Russians had a laser beam that shot down the Challenger. Uh, yeah. Just crazy stuff like that. 
Um, and then maybe just talk a little bit about like your engaging of conspiracy theory and kind of pushing back against it. Well, it's sort of impossible to get away from this stuff. And, and especially um, at NASA and later on at the Smithsonian, I was constantly bombarded with questions about Roswell, uh, alien autopsies. We never landed on the moon. I could go on and on. And, um, and, and so that forced me to sort of respond to these sorts of things. The, um, and in fact, every year at the, um, at the Smithsonian, uh, at, on the anniversary, it's always in, in, in uh, late June, early July timeframe, um, the Roswell incident from 1947, uh, I always gave a public lecture on that. And, uh, and, and that was always great fun because uh, a lot of conspiracy theorists would come out and sort of engage and, and you know, it, it's sort of fruitless to, uh, uh, to debate these things because there's no way to win. But, uh, but uh, I always enjoyed the jousting. And, um, and, and of course the moon hoax has been a, a big issue as well. Uh, when I was at NASA, uh, there was a, um, a, a Fox network special about how we never landed on the moon. Yeah. And, um, and the official position at NASA was, of course, we landed on the moon. We're not even going to dignify that with a response. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that mostly worked until this sort of got raised to a new level after this so-called documentary. And, um, and, and we were inundated uh, with requests from kids, from their parents, from teachers. And they were saying, especially the teachers and the parents, my kids are telling me about this. How do I respond? I don't have the information necessary to refute it. And NASA was of no help in that sense because they didn't want to dignify it with a response. And so based upon that, we sat down and came up with, um, you know, some efforts to try to counteract that. And, and it was relatively simple. It was putting up, uh, you know, a frequently asked questions uh, web page and creating some educational materials for, for teachers and parents to sort of respond to the questions. And I was heavily involved in that as the historian, uh, you know, to try to, to try to help deal with this. And, uh, you know, I think we, we did okay with that. There are, there was always the concern that the giggle factor associated with was a, was a detriment, you know, and and so a lot of us, myself included, often didn't want to necessarily engage in it, but but you sort of have to over time, uh, especially when it's become such a part of the culture. Often said with a wink and a nod, uh, not that necessarily people who promulgate this always believe it. It's just sort of. You know, you see it in passing. Well, of course, we didn't land on the moon. You know, Stanley Kubrick, of course, filmed it in his studio where he shot 2001, <laughs> A Space Odyssey. I mean, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it's all nonsense. And it's easily refuted. Uh, and I am concerned that those who are trying to teach children uh, have the information they need to be able to do so. Beyond that, you're never going to defense. You're never going to convince a diehard conspiracy theorist that they're wrong. Yeah, you know, I think it's the the uh, that approach to engaging this is important. I think in the past, um, you had like um, Darwinists who said, "I'm not going to, you know, engage young Earth creationists." You had uh, historians of the Holocaust saying, "I'm not going to engage uh, Holocaust deniers." I think the approach that Michael Shermer took with Skeptic Magazine was we actually do have to engage it and we yeah. and, and actually take it very seriously. Right. Um, and because, uh, you know, this, just a perfect example, I mean, just, uh, did you ever see the idea that people would actually believe in the flat earth and that NASA is part of the conspiracy? Did you ever get anything like that? Because to me, that I just came out of the blue. I can't believe, I guess there are millions of people now who think that we live on a flat earth. I don't know that there's millions. There's some, and they're very vocal. Yeah. 
but but how many people actually believe that? Even if they say it again, sort of a, with a wink and a nod sometimes. Uh, you know, I, isn't this funny? But um, you know, it's hard to when you see spacecraft orbiting Earth, and uh, it, it's sort of hard to accept the idea of a flat Earth. Anyway. Uh, but again, uh, those who believe this stuff are not persuaded by evidence. And, and so they're, they're a lost cause. Just forget about them. Um, if, uh, if, if somebody's sort of questioning and they say, you know, I don't know about this. Well, OK, so what what are the things that you can say about this that that might be helpful in that context? And that that's where I think it's a useful activity. So I grew up a lifelong Cubs fan. Uh, my father's favorite baseball player was Stan Musial, though, growing up. Uh, I sort of like him, too. There he is. I kind of thought that's who it was behind you. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Oh, that's great. That's awesome, dude. Um, so I just I thought I was going through your biography. And of course, uh, you've written some stuff on baseball. Um, and one of the characters that you wrote about was Charlie Finley, who, by the way, I'm from Northwest Indiana. And he had this big man, the big uh, thing on Michigan City or somewhere along that line you could drive yep. by on the 8094. I've, I've, I've been there. We went in there. We toured it. Uh, uh, it's quite a place. And so maybe just talk a little bit about your love affair with baseball and what got you to decide to maybe start really writing about that. Well, I'm fascinated by baseball. I've been a fan since I was a little kid. My um, uh, my parents grew up in Southern Illinois. My grandfather tried out for the Cardinals when he was a, a young man. And, um, and he always said that he and his best friend went to St. Louis and tried out. And, uh, and this was in the late teens. Um, and, uh, and they offered both of them a minor league contract. Uh, and, and my grandfather did not accept the contract because his mother did not want him playing baseball on Sunday. Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, his best friend did, uh, and his best friend made it to the majors and spent several years with the Cardinals and ultimately ended up as the manager of the team. His name was Ray Blades. Oh, wow. And uh, he told me that story, and he said, and I was just as good a player as Ray was. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it was sort of always the what might have been uh, sort of thing. And so I was brought up as a Cardinals fan. Stan Musel, when I was a little kid, it was in the twilight of his career. He was my favorite player. There's been a lot of great Cardinals players since that time. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of them, but Stan is still the main guy from my perspective. Stan, the man, you know, I, 1998, you know, we had the strike, right. And it was so exciting being a Cubs and Cardinals fan. Kids would come back from school. It's Sammy. Yeah, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, you bet. And so maybe just talk a little bit about your feelings about that time. Well, you know, um, it's it was it was exciting, obviously. I, I mean, I, I was devastated with the 94 strike and how they lost the season in the World Series. And, um, and not that the Cardinals were going to be a, a serious contender that year. They really weren't. But uh but uh, I was, I also, I, when I was a kid, we moved to South Carolina and I sort of followed the, the Braves at that point. And the Braves had a great team at, the, at that time. And they had every possibility of winning a World Series, but uh, not to be. Uh, but coming back from that, um, you know, a lot of us were sort of upset about all of this and how they, you know, why couldn't these guys get together and decide uh, how to slice the pie equitably, equitably so everybody uh, was successful and they're, and they're having the same problem right now as well. And, um, and I always side with the players. I, I, I do. I mean, there's no question about that. The, uh, the, the leadership of, of major league baseball has been about, uh, has been basically about extracting as much wealth as possible on, on the backs of, of players who are the reason everybody comes anyway. It's not, it's not because we care about owners. Um, and Charlie was Charlie Finley was one of the guys who did this, but he also had some of the best approaches to responding to some of these issues. And so uh, so the book, the, the biography of Charlie Finley is really about uh, sort of uh, an upstart in the uh, the ownership uh, class of Major League Baseball and how to change the nature of things. Charlie had a zillion ideas. 
He had 100 ideas a day, three of which would be good. He could never tell the difference of what was good and what was bad. So he constantly would push all of them. Um, and, and, and some of them were ones that were adopted, at least at some level, the, the designated hitter rule. Let's get some more offense into this game. And so the American League adopted that. That was Charlie's idea. Um, in the in the in the strikes uh, and the uh, the problems in in labor relations in the early 1970s, where the uh, players were pushing for free agency, which makes all the sense in the world. You know, they should be able to 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 ply their services wherever those services are desired. Um, and the owners were dead set against that. They wanted to tie the team indefinitely, or they wanted to tie the player indefinitely to the team with the intention of being able to control them and pay them whatever they wished. Um, and that was a, a real serious problem. But Charlie had an answer to that. You know, there's a there's a great story. We tell it in the book um, in which um, the, uh, the owners are trying to maintain what, the, what was known as a reserve clause. And this may be a little too detailed for people on this podcast, but it essentially tied the player for his service in baseball to the, in, to the team that had originally signed him. And you couldn't really go anywhere else. And, um, and they were trying to make the case, you know, every time a contract is up, I ought to be able to negotiate a contract with whoever I wish for whatever amount I want. And um, and one of the lawyers for Major League Baseball said, look, I got to tell you, this is not going to you guys can't continue to operate like this uh, just because you go to work for the A&P store or name the store of your choice when you're young doesn't mean you have to work for them the rest of your life. You can go anywhere you want. And that's the way the players uh, have to be treated as well. And uh, and Charlie said. And the owner said, well, if we do that, then the prices are going to go out of control. We're not going to be able to control the budgets and on and on and on. And Charlie said, well, the easy way to solve that problem is make everybody a free agent every year because that will depress the whole market. And that was the that was the answer that would have been a better one than what they ended up with. But uh, anyway, uh, Charlie's a fascinating character. He is, yeah. And if you want to talk about, you know, we talked about this off camera, orange baseballs, and he also <laughs> wanted to do the designated runner, right? A designated runner, a designated hitter, the orange baseballs. He thought you could see those better uh, uh, in the twilight. He may have been right about that. But, uh, I mean, we, we interviewed Raleigh Fingers for the book. And Raleigh said, yeah, we tried those things in spring training. You, I could not hang on to them the way I was supposed to. It was just a different feel, and I couldn't control the ball away. I, and I didn't want anything to do with it. And, and, we, and we talked to the, to the batters. And Joe Rudy said, yeah, you know, that thing would just go in all directions. You couldn't, it, it didn't act the way a normal baseball acted. And so what I was used to doing wouldn't work anymore. Hmm. And in that sense, um, it was not a successful experiment, although it's, you know, it was reasonable to try it, um, you know, and he did all kinds of crazy things to promote the game. He was also very committed to, uh, to sort of, we need to make room for normal people to come to the games mm. and, uh, and keep the prices low, at least in the outfield, so that, you know, if you spend a buck, you can sit in the bleachers. And, and that's enough, you know, that's, that, that's not so much money that almost anybody can afford to come on occasion. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's a lot of people who would look at this today and say, you know, if I'm going to take a family of four to the ball game, I'm going to spend a couple hundred dollars doing it because, mm -hmm. and, and you can't do that all the time. Uh, and so it's out of reach of a lot of families in terms of attending it. Uh, and Charlie always was uh, was trying to make that possible. And he did things to attract people. And some of the things were crazy, um, like Hot Pants Day in Oakland one year, <laughs> in which all the women had a doubleheader. Uh, all the women who wore hot pants, short shorts, basically, uh, to the game would be admitted free. And between the two games, they paraded around out in the field and, and had a great time. Um, I'm sure. I mean, he had a full house for that, but <laughs> sort of a crazy idea. Yeah, I just uh, it reminds me a lot of like a like kind of he was like a Bill Vec character. Yeah. Um, 
as I'm also curious this yeah, uh, by the way, I have to tell you a Bill Vex story though. So sure, Bill, Bill Vex said, and he was an owner of the White Sox and a number of other teams over the years who was famous for doing this kind of stuff. And and uh, and and his comment was after Charlie did some of this stuff was, uh, you know, if I ever run out of ideas, Charlie's out of business. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I, I actually, and I don't even know if I cover this in the book, but you know, there's another prominent owner in Oakland, uh, L. Davis. Uh, did Charlie Finley and L. Davis ever in their act and get along? Uh, they never got along, <laughs> but <laughs> they were there at the same time. Uh -huh. And actually, Charlie never lived in Oakland. Charlie was in Chicago. Got it. And, I, and he did crazy things. Um, so this is the pre-internet era and television, you know, they didn't broadcast games all the time. Uh, and so I, when I grew up, uh, you know, we had the game of the week on Saturday afternoon, mm -hmm. and that was pretty much what you saw. And sometimes if you were, lived in a major league city, uh, you would see that local team because they had a local television contract. But, uh, but you didn't see that much baseball um, on television. You could hear it on a radio, except Charlie couldn't get radio broadcast from the Bay Area. So he would call the uh, folks out in the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, to and and be on the telephone and have them have the radio playing so he could hear the radio broadcast over his telephone while the games were on while he was in Chicago. I love it. That's great. Wow. So just as a Cubs fan, just want to remind you a couple things. One, we won the World Series in 2016, so we broke the curse. And I actually ran into a uh, a scout for the Cubs last time. I was sitting next to Richard Bushman's nephew coming back from. Uh, um, Utah, and in front of me was a scout for the Cubs who had the ring, had a ring. eight diamonds yeah. in, in the ring. He had it on. It was so awesome. Um, yeah, I'd be afraid to wear a ring like that. But you know. Yeah, was, he was just wearing it for a special occasion for a championship for the minor league team there in uh, Utah. Um, but also we have the Sandberg game. And uh, so, you know, there's a few things I could, there's a couple things I could hold over you. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I got my own stories, too, but, you know, we can we can uh, uh, talk about that another time. Maybe. Yes, we could. You ever, you ever run into George Castle, the writer? The, the I have writer? not. Okay, yeah, because he wrote a book about the rivalry between our teams in the 90s. So either way, uh, Roger, I just want to thank you so much for coming onto the program here and uh, indulging me with the baseball and NASA talk as well. Um, you know, this is really cool, and I'm really honored and privileged that you came on. Um, I just wanted, do you have any last words, final words, uh, summation you want to share with my audience? Um, no, I mean, uh, thanks for everybody for listening. It, it, it was fun to talk about these books and, um, and other sort of things. Um, maybe we can do another book another time. I think so. I have, I have a few ideas already brewing for some future interviews with you. So folks, I just want to remind you to uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification button for when a new episode is coming out. Uh, we are in the process of uploading our stuff to the major podcasts. So hopefully we'll get this one up and running soon as well. Uh, also, uh, mormonbookreviews.com. And if you need to get a hold of me, don't forget that it's mormonbookreviews at gmail.com. You all have yourself a great day. And thanks, Roger, for coming on. My pleasure. See you soon.